Oh, uh, how's it going? You going doing well today? <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. How are you, Max? Pretty good. Excited yeah. to be here. Yeah, me too. Oh, yeah. So we are here today to talk about applying the Moneyball method to sales management. And this is very exciting because we have the one and only P. Kazanjin here. But audience, that's your lucky day because he is not alone. He has Max, <laughs> who is the sales strategy advisor and account executive at Atrium. Um, so oh, yeah. please consider this your lucky day of the week. Uh, we are very excited <laughs> to have you here. But before we jump into the content, and the content is very exciting, it's all about sports and sales management, um, I'm going to do a quick icebreaker with my speakers. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to start with Max. Max, if you could pick a superpower, what would that be? Mm, I wish I could have like automatic like lie detecting. I feel like that'd be pretty helpful in sales <laughs> to be able to know when my prospects are not being truthful about buying process and value and stuff like that. So I think that'd be pretty good. That's a good one. Yeah. What about you? But Pete? I feel that like the best account executives do have that superpower and you kind of like grow it over time. It's like you're just pessimistic. <laughs> well, they're pessimistic and also you like you hear the thing that this person's saying under what they're actually saying. Like this is something that I talk with like our staff about all the time. It's like what they actually say. What do their tone say? What do their face <laughs> say? Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, gosh, my superpower, um, blah, 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 blah. I think Eduardo would have to be like being in two places at once, but it would oh, be like cool. being, being on like two calls at once, which I think is, I don't know, maybe that's like the boring version of that superpower. Like I could be on like, <laughs> I could be on like two zooms at once, or I could be like doing this presentation with Max, but like also being on like a customer call or something. Who knows? <laughs> that like. I mean, it's a superpower. We can make it up, right? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically being the Jesus Christ of sales, right? The omnipresence <laughs> everywhere. That's Got the beard, cool. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So today we are here to talk about data-driven uh, sales management, uh, applying the money ball method to sales management. But before mm -hmm. we jump in, I have one more question for Pete. Pete, how do you call it when 27,000 sales nerds join forces to help each other? Hmm. Awesome. <laughs> you call it Modern Sales Pros. And uh... today's event is brought to you by the team at Modern Sales Pros. My name is Eduardo. I am a community events manager at Modern Sales Pros and your host today. And for those of you not familiar with MSP, we are the world's largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, sales leadership, sales and revenue operations, and sales enablement. And we call them our Modern Sales Pros. And our oh, mission yeah. is to create an environment for our members to answer questions they would struggle to solve on their own and to help them see corners that they might not know about. And with 27,000 people helping each other, I am sure no questions will be left unanswered and no problems will be left <laughs> unsolved. Um, and we do that through like live sessions like this one you're about to experience. Uh, we have quarterly summits, very exciting. And we also are starting to get back into in-person events, which is very, very fun. And if you're not already part of the MSP uh, squad, you will be invited to join after this <laughs> event. And as I mentioned, we have quarterly summits. And if you like the content you're going to hear today, you will love our three-day revenue excellence summit happening oh, yeah. October 11 through the 13th. Are you excited about it, Pete? Oh, my gosh. The speakers are bananas. <laughs> also, the, 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 the graphic design on the landing page is quite, quite amazing as well. <laughs> Edward, well, thank it. it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I just put a link in the chat so you guys can sign up for it while I explain to you what the summit is all about. Because we pulled together 24, more than 24 events during the three-day um, event time. Uh, and you're going to hear from uh, uh, the CEO of Zoom Info, Kensai, Kaibo, Cowboy Ventures, and Winnie by Design, as well as sales leaders at Lattice, Pendle, Outreach, Atrium, and much, much more. So the link, link yeah. is in there in the chat. Don't waste, don't waste your time. Just sign up for it. It's going to be amazing. And mm -hmm. my last thing before we jump into this content are some housekeeping notes. Um, this event is being recorded, so you will be able to access all the knowledge from Pete and Max um, in their MSP previous events page. Um, so we don't let all this content go into the ether. You will access it and you will have it handy whenever you need it. And please use the Q&A function. I was talking with Max and Pete in the backstage and they were saying like they love answering questions. It's 
the thing oh, that yeah. they like the most. <laughs> so please use the Q&A send your quest <laughs> and send your questions in the chat so they can answer it. Um, but for uh, right now, I'm going to pass it to Pete so he can uh, introduce Atrium, our sponsor for today. Uh, we love having Atrium as our sponsor. Um, and then Pete, you can introduce Atrium, yourself, and Max, and then just jump into content. Yeah, for sure. I would love to. Thank you very much, Eduardo. That was uh, that was absolutely fantastic. I'll see you. See you later. I'll see you later. When you when, when you when you guys when you come to to pull us off uh, pull us off stage, yeah. yeah so um, I'm super pumped about this topic because it's a uh, it's a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Obviously, the data driven sales management stuff, but also like the the money ball and kind of like the you know the, the change and the development of like sports analytics over time. I think is is very instructive. Um, as relates to kind of like what we do day to day, you know, as sales leaders. Um, for folks who aren't familiar, Atrium makes data driven sales management software. It's software that exists to help sales managers. So, AE, SDR, AM, CSM managers and leaders use metrics and data to improve the performance of their teams, to measure, uh, manage, and improve the, the execution of their teams by applying, you know, management by metric. Um, and it's one of the cool things about Atrium is it's super, super easy to set up. You just log in with your Salesforce credentials using a read-only connection to your, your CRM. It takes about five minutes, uh, and Atrium will show you, you know, how your reps are performing across um, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of metrics. So it's something that's you know, very cool for folks to check out. Uh, we'll talk a little, little bit more about Atrium later, but you know, kind of in the context of our, of our content. Um, but wanted to introduce uh, myself and Max. So, um, I'm Pete Kazanji. I'm one of the founders of Atrium, and um, you know, been working on Atrium here for about five and a half years or so. Prior to Atrium, I started a software company called Talentbin uh, that was acquired by Monster Worldwide in um, in 2014, uh, and that's really where I went from being kind of like a business generalist founder to our first seller, first sales manager, sales leader, etc. Um, also wrote a book on startup sales called uh, called Founding Sales. Um, that, uh, you know, there's kind of the, the summation of my experience uh, doing, you know, becoming a sales leader at, at Talentbin. And of course, I also started Modern Sales Pros. So a uh, couple of, just just think a little bit about uh, sales here and there. Max, you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself, tell folks what you work on here at Atrium, and then also, you know, what you've done before. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm Max Klang. I'm a, a seller account executive here at, at Atrium. And uh, before my time at Atrium, I had a, a run at Bright Edge and then a run at Asana. And uh, yeah, I think about sales all the time. And I think one of the, like the most fun things about being at Atrium is just like working with sales managers and, and kind of you know, walking through the process of Atrium and, and kind of teaching them how to be data driven. So yeah, excited to chat. Yeah. It is super fun. I mean, we get to like meet all sorts of like great people. I mean, and, and some not less great people, but also like you really when you find people who like get it, right? And are like it's like I, what I like to refer to as like the future CROs club, <laughs> future CROs of America club. You're it's kind of like oh man, this person like really gets it. Like they're gonna they're gonna be like really amazing and data driven. Um, just before we kind of get started here. Um, we have an offer for folks. Uh, if you'd like to get a, these are a couple of my favorite um, books on sales management right now and, and data-driven sales management. Uh, Five Secrets of the Sales Coach is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's written by Hillman Sori and Corey Bray. Um, it's written as a narrative, like kind of a parable. So it's like really, really super readable, super page turner. Like you can crush it in like, you know, a weekend. Um, and then Michelle Vazana's Crushing Quota, which is very like, sp it's, it's a little bit more academic, um, but also like kind of more tactical, kind of like more of like a textbook. Um, these are a good like yin and yang together on the topic of, um, on the topic of sales management. And then of course, um, you know, if you'd like uh, a, a little uh, handy dandy atrium uh, Yeti mug here. So if you'd like to go ahead and sign up for that, um, I think we're going to go ahead and drop a, uh, a link in the chat here so you can you're welcome to go ahead and sign up for those we'll send, get them sent out for you all we ask for in exchange is a, a short discovery conversation with one of our lovely account executives over here so um we're gonna talk about like these are the things that we're gonna cover today it's gonna be super fun um kind of like party in the front business in the back i guess um <laughs> and uh we're going to be talking about money, ball, and sales management, like why it's something that that you should wrap your mind around. Um, 
data driven, like how data driven um, management has kind of like permeated the realm of like high end athletics, um, how that is making its way into sales and some kind of real life examples um, from our customers that we've seen around like using data to improve the performance of teams. But, you know, first and foremost, um, raise your hand if you've if you've watched the the movie Moneyball. All right, Max has cool. Um, feel that like some of the other folks have, but <laughs> there's this amazing scene in it um, where Jonah Hill is like having this conversation with Brad Pitt and Billy Bean, and um, and essentially what he talks about like out out in like the parking lot is how there's this huge failure in in um, in baseball management around understanding how teams work why players are successful or not successful and so as a result it leads organizations to do a bad job of managing their you know managing their players and uh, and managing their teams and and like it's just such such a great like little terse um scene where you can swap in the word sales for like baseball <laughs> in the scene and it's like perfect and it applies right and and i think really like sales management or historically sales management has has largely been not nearly as data driven as um as it should be and, and part of it is because historically like you know 10 years ago 20 years ago there wasn't a lot of data being captured into databases or crms or in digital systems in order to do that interpretation but but now there is and so the fact that like a lot of organizations haven't shifted their thinking um really sets those organizations up not for not for success and so what we're going to talk about is kind of like what that shift has looked like over time here as it's made its way across, you know, high-end athletics. And then we're going to talk about it a little bit as it relates to, um, to, to sales. So probably the best example of this would be um, the, like Moneyball was initially popularized in a book by, um, oh, too, too many Christmas, what's the guy's name? Michael Lewis, right? Um, that, um, you know, that was eventually turned into a movie. And, and really what it kind of came down to is that baseball was one of the first places where, um, metrics and kind of analytics made their way into and into athletics in a very meaningful way. And, and there was a couple of reasons why. One was that, um, so baseball, Max and I are both baseball players by background. Um, baseball is a slow enough game where you can manually score it, right? Like you can score it, like, you know, you can, you can score it using the, the score books one. And then, so as a result, like the game is recorded in a way that can be interpreted after the fact. Second, like there's like a huge sample size because teams have play 162 games a year. Um, there's been a hundred years of like baseball history. So like there's a big data set there. And so what, what the A's kind of figured out um, initially and actually in fairness, like degenerate gamblers in Vegas kind of like figured it out first, but then it kind of made its way to the, to the A's. They figured out that they could use this information for um, for recruiting purposes, and so like that was actually so essentially what they could figure out was players that like maybe didn't look really amazing, right? Like they didn't look like Brad Pitt as an example, right? Um, but like their stats indicated that they kicked ass. Those people would be cheaper to recruit because like the rest of the market wasn't bidding after them, but they could get what they needed from them in terms of like hits, getting on base, runs, et cetera. And so you can kind of see this playing out here in this chart where on the y-axis here, this is a uh, relative um, payroll above league average here. So you can see like really expensive teams here and then really cheapy teams down here. And then down here is um, the wins above league average or below league average. And so in general, you can kind of see this linear relationship here where um, it's like you pay more for people and <laughs> guess what? They do better. Like, so for instance, up here is the New York Yankees, right? One of our uh, sales managers, Sean is a big Yankees fan, mainly because he just likes to them to, you know, he likes his teams to spend lots of money for not, not a lot of marginal wins. But one thing that you can see is that the A's are down here and they kind of like buck the trend here. Yeah. Someone who actually, Philip's got a good question. Why was Detroit paying so much and sucking so bad? Good question, Philip. It's the opposite of data-driven management. It's data-driven like mismanagement perhaps. Um, <laughs> but what you can see is that the A's were doing a great job. They were paying below league average here. But, but like doing a great job, like winning a lot. And so that was something that was like really, really clever on their part. And so, you know, they went on to like win a bunch of, um, 
you know, a bunch of league championships as a result at a low, at a low cost. Um, so, but it didn't like stay there. Right. Um, it actually then made its way into, into basketball as well. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the, <laughs> and may, I don't know, maybe there was something in the water, but it was the A's that figured this out here in, in baseball first. And then it was the, the golden state warriors that figured it out who are another Oakland like Bay area team. And so the key insight that the warriors figured out was that in basketball, right? Like you've, as you get further away from the basket, it gets harder to make a shot, right? These are shot percentages right here. So 60% of shots go in here, 40% here, 35 to 40% here, 30% back here. But the thing is in basketball is when you get beyond the three point line, all of a sudden the, the basket you make goes from being worth two points to being worth three points. So 50% more. And so the funny thing is, is what you can see, this is the expected points per shot right here which is a blend between the shot percentage, the likelihood of the shot going in, and then also how much the shot is worth. And so what you can see here is that in here, you've got this like purple no man's land where like every, any given shot is worth like, you know, 0.85 um, points. But then if you step right beyond the three point line, well, look at that. All of a sudden it goes up to 1.05, right? Or 1.1. And so that was a key insight that they had was that if you just get right beyond the arc there, all of a sudden um, you have a 30% higher points per shot, right? Um, thank you, Mark, for the, uh, for the call out there. Um, and so what ended up happening was like the Warriors were the first people who really took this to scale. Um, and they did a couple of different things. Like so when we were doing an initial research for Atrium, we actually interviewed their analytics team over there. Uh, a guy named Kirk Lakob, who's uh, Joe Lakob's kid. He was the assistant GM who was responsible for, um, for analytics and stuff. And um, it actually was like right around in here because that's like when we started Atrium. And so you can see that the Warriors went from kind of like kind of a crappy team to just like kicking everyone's ass. Um, and, and where that kind of came from was one, like it, it's it's a part and parcel of data-driven management where it's like you have this insight and then you do things with it you don't just like have an insight be like yay we had an insight like you change behavior so in this case it was like hey we've got steph curry let's like have him shoot like hey steph it's okay to shoot threes like don't worry about it in fact shoot more in fact hey everybody can you feed the ball to steph curry so he can so he can shoot more threes right and actually hey why don't we recruit some more people who like behave like steph curry so instead of like triple teaming Steph Curry. Now we can have Steph and Clay and, and somebody else, right? Whoever. And like you change your behavior of your team in alignment with this, this insight. And so what you can see here is like, it was a pretty meaningful exploit that, that led to multiple, multiple championships um, on the part of the, on the part of the Warriors. But this is another really kind of key insight here where just Ideally, what happens is when when an organization has an insight, um, and this is one of the things that we you know work with our customers on, is if you have a kind of a key insight, you don't want to like keep it to yourself. Um, like you don't want to have just one rep behaving in a certain way that is like high win rate. You want to permeate that across your across the team. Similarly, what happened in the NBA was this is what the shot spray this uh, shot spray looked like in two thousand one two thousand two around 2019 and 2020, like everyone had figured it out. <laughs> right? It was no longer a relative advantage on the part of, um, on the part of the, on the part of the warriors there. So if you like, look at this uh, kind of like graphic right here on the right, looks kind of like this one right here, right? <laughs> like everyone kind of figured out <laughs> because now what you had was coaches were like, Hey, if you're doing like a mid range jumper, like you're going to run wind sprints until you puke because like, like that's just a waste of, of, of time. And so you can kind of see what this is like, what this look like over time. Like some of the people are figuring it out, kind of figure like this is the percentage of shots that were threes versus two. So it's like right around here in 2015. Then it's like, <laughs> right, everyone figured it out. Um, and so like, this is a great example of like a key insight, like a data-driven insight happening. And then like organizations adopting that insight be like for fun and profit. Because if you don't adopt that insight, then you get your butt kick by the warriors right or like if you don't adopt that insight then like you don't hit quota or your team is not successful and and so i think that that's like a really great case study of how that permeated over time the other thing i would note is um there's always like the next evolution 
of like data driven behavior and data driven management. And so this is um, Max, when you were playing, um, when, when did you, um, I forgot when you graduated from, uh, from Chico, what was it? 20, 2018, 2018. Were there much shifts going on then? Um, kind of Chico's like, like head coach was like pretty progressive on that stuff for like a college, like a D2 coach. And so like, yeah, definitely a lot of that on our team. And then like, Mm -hmm. I was like a ground ball pitcher. So like every time I was pitching, like there was a lot of shifts on like the pole side for our like infield team. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. You, you and me both. I was a ground ball pitcher because I could not (laughs) overpower people. Me and me and Greg Maddox. Um, So, so yeah, like there's always the next iteration. And so a good example of this was um, in, um, you know, in Moneyball or like in baseball, it started out with recruiting, which only like happens once a year or whatever. Like, I don't know, maybe there's like some trades going on in the middle of the year as well. Um, but what it made its way to, to was like shifts in the infield, right? So essentially having the players, like the, the defenders shift um, in reaction to how a batter has a propensity to to bat and so like this is an example here like there's this guy curtis granderson this is essentially what his spray chart looked like from 2015 to 2019 and so you can see like we've got line drives ground balls fly balls pop-ups here right so like he has a tendency to like hit all his ground balls very intensely here to the right side of the the right side of the infield Right. And so what would happen is so like the right thing to do there is to then shift your players, right. To like shift your shortstop over here to like drop your second baseman back to move your third baseman over here, because you're just going to make it more likely that, you know, uh, Curtis grounds, grounds it to, you know, the, the shortstop who's sitting on top of second base or, or what have you here. Um, And so the funny thing was that like, this is another kind of lesson in you really have to adopt, like adapt to data driven realities. Cause if you don't like, you're going to be host, right? Cause the market doesn't care. The market moves on. Um, and so this, this poor guy right here, Ryan, Ryan Howard was like, you know, he was a pretty solid, um, a pretty solid player, um, like really struggled to adopt, uh, to adapt to the the shift there right and so what you can kind of see is from 2010 to 2016 when when people were shifting against him his batting average dropped from you know 424 against no shift to 282 which is like not miserable like you know it's above the mendoza line so that's good but it's not like amazing right and you can see that his slugging percentage really dropped substantially as well um and like he's on base percentage and and like essentially just like became like a very mediocre batter (laughs) when people um i know right and so like it's kind of crazy that he wasn't able to um it's kind of crazy that he wasn't able to shift like that it's kind of like i don't know i i one of my favorite scenes in Moneyball is when like Billy Bean is talking with um david justice in the batting cage and he's like he's like david i need you to take more Right. Cause like when you take more, your batting average gets up. And also people like they're going to walk you, man. They're like afraid of you, even though like you can't really hit <laughs> for power anymore. Like they're still thinking about you like four years ago. And David justice is like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. You're not paying me to like, you know, to take. And, uh, and Billy beans like, well, actually um, I think it was the Mets or maybe the Yankees at that point. It's like, actually the Yankees are paying most of your salary. And, and actually I am paying you to, to get on base, to walk. And so it's, it feels to me that like, maybe, I don't know, maybe there wasn't a, a data driven conversation or data driven coaching conversation with Ryan um, there to the extent that there could have been. And like, you know, with really unpleasant results, <laughs> which is probably not too right? dissimilar to like trying to have a coaching conversation with like a very senior enterprise rep. Right. Oh, dude. Yeah. Or yeah, dude. exactly. With a senior enterprise rep for sure. Right. <laughs> trying to tell me how to do my job. Get off me. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and we see this with, like, some of our, our customers as well. And I think there's, like, I don't know, as the kids say these days, like, a vibe shift going on a little bit here where mm-hmm. I remember I remember back in the day when I was selling Atrium, um, back before I was a full-time talking head, um, the, like, you would talk to, it's not just, like, senior reps, it's also, like, senior leaders, mm-hmm. right? Like, what are you talking about, like? You know, I've been I've been selling and managing teams for for 30 years, and it's like, yeah, God bless you, man. Like, of course, um, but like that doesn't mean that we don't adopt new new things that show up because if we don't, like, someone's gonna kick your ass, right, or you're gonna get replaced. Um, 
Yeah. And so I, I think one of the other things that I really kind of like makes me chuckle in this presentation is um, that the A's are like, it's like one of those things where like, once you have a data driven muscle, um, it's like, you can do lots of different like data driven things, right? So the A's obviously were really good at doing this in, um, you know, with respect to recruiting, they're also like crazy shifters. Right. So what you can kind of see here is most like the the major league in general, um, you know, 20 percent of the time shifting against righties, 50 percent of the time shifting against lefties. The A's are like bananas. Right. Like they they shift twice as much as, um, you know, they, they shift twice as much as as the league average against righties. And um, and just like they're, they're pretty much always shifting against lefties there. And you know, and, and it works, right? Um, so that's, yeah, th this is kind of the, the idea of like, there's always like a next frontier around using data and metrics to improve, like to gain an advantage, to gain an edge there. Um, the other thing I wanted to call out here is that this is just like extending across like pretty much every category of, um, of athletics. I know that we're all salespeople here. We like to golf, right? <laughs> I'm actually a terrible golfer. Actually, you're a pretty good golfer. I'm I'm terrible. I like Top Golf. That's like my favorite because Same. because there because there's wings, <laughs> there's wings involved. <laughs> um, so there's this cool thing in golf that I learned about um, called the the decade golf uh, analysis system. Essentially, what it came kind of came down to is this this guy whose name escapes me right now did um you know did some pretty good analysis on on a kind of like what what causes high scores in golf? Um, and really what it kind of comes down to is that high shot counts always come from bogeys and double bogeys. And you might kind of be like, oh, well, it's obvious, like a higher, <laughs> like, a of course, a bogey is higher. But really what it kind of comes down to is it's like, it's not that people are, are making pars. Um, it's that like when they really go sideways where they shouldn't have because they made a, a too aggressive earlier shot. And so what ends up happening is like things go sideways and then all of a sudden you've got a bogey all of a, like you were chasing a birdie, you hosed yourself and now you, and now you're not even like getting par, like you're scram like you're hoping you're going to get a bogey or like you're super hosed and you're going to get a double bogey. Um, and so like, this is kind of their insight was like, you know, like birdie hunting is vanity in general, you're probably going to like, you're going to get hosed. What you want to do is like, you're not accurate enough to lay up right? You should always just try to get clo closer to the, closer to the hole. Um, I think this is, there's like a lesson here. It's like, you know, vanity will always screw you. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Van I mean, in, a, in deals, <laughs> in sports, like you're always like vanity will always hose you. Um, and um, yeah. And so like, this is a really kind of cool kind of spray here of um, there's this tournament called Genesis at the, um, Riviera Country Club and like there's I don't know it's like this pretty famous hole and what you can see here is like this is back in 2015 you can see all the players here um shooting like essentially everybody's like trying to lay up right here because they're telling themselves a story like oh you know you hit off the tee I'm gonna go ahead and like lay up here um right and um and then i'm gonna attack the attack the green from here but the problem of course is that um well what would end up happening is like people would lay up here and then they'd like proceed to put in the bunker or like overshoot or skid off the green or or what have you right and so what you can kind of see now is um and and you can kind of see that right here there's like a lot of intensity of blacks there that are bogeys um like everybody kind of tries to lay up and then of course they hose themselves by <laughs> by because they they have a they have a bogey um there and and so what what ended up shifting there is like so now the 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 tour just goes for it now right? you can see like these are you know these are the shots where the, the people are going for here and um and everybody's you know in general um their you know the average score on the whole has has dropped substantially because people are not telling themselves this like fake narrative that they're going to um that they're going to uh they're going to be able to lay up and and make it so cool so that's like a little bit of a primer on um on data-driven uh sports management and so now what we're going to do is um we're going to change gears a little bit and kind of talk about this as relates to um sales and i think the argument that I would love to, you know, advance to everybody who's here today 
is that the same shift is is going on in sales and like it's time to kind of get on the train there because if you don't you're gonna <laughs> if if you don't you're gonna be a sad panda um <laughs> like our our buddy our buddy ryan here um and we're going from kind of like this realm of of like of sales more to you know data driven um you know scientific uh etc and so similarly so that so how does that play out and where where kind of plays out is it means getting very granular around the measurement of behaviors and and kind of like execution in the sales motion and so again an, uh, an analog here would be in um in athletics right we've got our outcomes we've got our inputs and then we have our efficiency metrics here and oftentimes people are like oh well like you can't measure quality etc it's like art it's like well that's actually not true <laughs> right you, you can measure quality um usually they show up in in ratios right like uh earn run average right max or mm -hmm. uh you know batting batting average against the pitcher or whatever max and i are both pitchers um <laughs> and um or you know or batting average as a uh as a you know as a batter and so by instrumenting these inputs and then also these efficiency metrics one you can set goals on them and also you can granularly understand where there are issues and then coach around them because like that's what we want to do is we want to we want to observe an issue change the behavior like coach the behavior change um in order and then measure the the output right like measure the, the change of the output there ideally and that's like the data-driven sales management loop there which we talk about more pre um more in some other master classes as well and so kind of the analogs to these things here in in ae land sorry in, in sales land would be things like you know our inputs are things that are like activities right so like in in sdr land there'd be things like emails and calls and like the unique number of accounts that are being interacted with or new accounts that are touched um in ae land the inputs are going to be things like you know customer facing meetings right like what i like to refer to as like the fundamental unit of selling is like a customer facing meeting but <laughs> it would be things like new opportunity inflow right new pipe own um and then there's like you know efficiency things as well so it's it's not just about how many customer facing meetings you're having it's also what your opportunity conversion rates look like Right? How are you converting things out of meeting pending or out of disco or out of POC or, or what have you? What is your win rate on ops that come into your pipe? What is your win rate off of different stages? Right? Do you have a win rate problem out of proposal because you shove proposals into the hands of people who didn't ask for them, which is like crufting up your, uh, you know, your, your forecast or, or what have you. And so by measuring all of these things, what we can do is we can see where there's a shortfall where there's an improvement area and we can kind of coach to that um and and fix that and you know coach that up right uh and so just a little bit of an advertisement here this is literally what atrium does is atrium helps sales managers use data to improve their performance of their team by measuring and managing by metric and the reason why this is super important um is because managers are really the key difference between high performing teams and teams that, that don't perform on really the biggest thing there. And there's a, the presentation that I do on data driven coaching kind of talks more detail about this is that it's not about like, you can notice that reps are like higher, like higher productivity um, or like a little bit like higher effort or what have you like, that's, that's cool. But the biggest thing is that what higher performing managers do is they get more of their reps to, outperformance right so rather than relying on a couple of of reps who are just like naturally high performing um who are kind of like carrying the team you move those like b players to a minus or like c plus players to like you know to b or b plus and then like you raise the whole tide and then so the the, the problem is is that or like the that it's on the manager, right? Like that is the, that is the work of management there, um, but that's like the upside there. And so in order to be a great manager, these are really the things that we see are important for customers to be doing. One, they should be doing deal inspection and strategy, um, 
usually not super hard to convince a AE manager to, to do deal <laughs> strategy, right? Like they're coming from being an AE themselves probably. So like, it's kind of like a, a natural thing. But then there's a number of other things that they should be doing as well, like tracking progress towards goals. They should be bringing data into their one-on-ones, not just like talking about deals, deals, deals. They should be monitoring the ramp of, uh, of new reps. They should be identifying issues, right? So they can fix them. Like, hey, your batting average falls off a cliff when there's a, <laughs> when there's a shift on. Maybe we should fix that. <laughs> Let's get in the batting cage here and and work on hitting the opposite the opposite way, uh, and then conversely standardizing the success of top performers. Like, wow, hmm, Steph, you have you have really big nights when you shoot more threes, huh? Maybe we should um maybe we should shoot more threes. All right, cool. Let's like let's try that on the next uh let's try that on the next game. And in fact, let's have somebody else like do that as well. So standardizing the success of top performers is really important as well. Max, when I mean obviously you you get to interact with like tons of our of our customers. Um where do you kind of see as like the most um impactful place for uh for managers to to like adopt data into their their sales management motion if you will? I'd say it's these bottom two ones is like where I see the biggest like blind spots is like identifying issues and then like resolutions for the issues. And then like the contrast of that is obviously like standardizing on what's working. I think like becoming aware of like what is broken or what is working is often like a huge challenge for, for managers. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think it's not like, it's not super surprising because like, look, um, a lot of managers are like, a lot of, as we like to say, a lot of organizations are not doing their managers tons of favors. Um, one, because they're not really enabling manage, like most sales enablement resources go to reps first and foremost. Uh, and most managers are, you know, they're, they're promoted AEs, which is great, right? Like, you know, if you think about the skill profile of an account executive, it's like high bias to action, you know, high, like high empathy, um, high communication, uh, high urgency, high, like, you know, um, execution, high activity. Um, it's not necessarily, um, you know, not, not everybody, but like, you know, th- there's not a lot of like analytical component to it, at least it certainly isn't training by background there. And then the second thing is, is that if you think about like how we expect managers to kind of like try to use data to manage their teams, this is kind of the best case scenario is like a, a giant wall of charts that you kind of like have to read the tea leaves of. And so what what ends up, unfortunately, what ends up happening is that people just kind of like cascade back to the thing that they're used to and comfortable with, which is like deals, 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 deals. Like we're going to talk about deals. And so what our claim would be to the market is that there's a, an opportunity to, because this is such an important thing, a very critical thing that, that our organizations should be investing in, there's an opportunity there to provide um, purpose-made tooling that helps managers use data to improve the performance measure and improve the performance of their their reps and so that's kind of what atrium looks like in practice is it's every kpi you could possibly want for your aesdr team um it's proactive tracking on goals so like kind of seeing how we're progressing on that weekly monthly or quarterly goals both for the outputs and also inputs it's early warning detection kind of like saying hey like this rep has a way lower win rate than these other reps over here. Like, Oh, like let's figure that out. Uh, and then also doing that kind of performance diagnosis that, that Max was referring to um, earlier. And so like, this is kind of what this kind of looks like in, in practice here is like, you know, it's not just like a wall of charts. It's, Hey, this rep right here has a win rate problem that needs to be investigated. Or this rep right here is ramping poorly with respect to their pipeline ownership as compared to all their peers have historically, or, Hey, this SDR is kicking ass and like has gotten to their, um, you know, has gotten to their accounts touched goal um, a couple of days in advance from their, you know, for the, for the month. That's awesome. High five. Are they doing something different than the rest of the team? And then lastly, doing this kind of diagnosis to say looking at combinations of metrics that are moving together in a way that to say to help identify that issue and then and then point a path to fixing the problem so hey this this um you know this rep right here has lower bookings than his peers by the way it's because his win rate is off it's not like his asp is not off his deal cycle is not off it's really just the fact that his win rate is light and it seems like he has a lighter 
um, number of opportunities. And so what we've observed is that when organizations um, kind of like inform their sales management motion with data, really kind of really compelling things come out of it. So like this is an organization that, um, you know, when they first started with Atrium, they had a pretty substantial pipeline hygiene problem here as measured by untouched opportunities. You can see that they had each rep had about like, you know, nine untouched opportunities in their pipe at any given point in time after they deployed Atrium that jumped down to around like three. So substantial reduction there. Turns out if you're like more on top of your pipeline, your win rates go up unsurprisingly. Um, and so what that ended up driving was uh, a substantial uh, amount of incremental bookings across the team. And so you can kind of see the same thing happening here in an SDR fun function as well. Um, what they observed on deploying Atrium was that the, the level of activity across the, the SDR team wasn't really what, where it needed to be. They were able to jump that up pretty substantially. Um, and, and what that led to is a 50% increase in opportunity production on a per SDR basis. So um, that's a little bit about Atrium. Now we're going to talk more about like, okay, well, how do you apply this in practice um, in your in your organization? Like how can you bring data-driven sales coaching and management into your into your teams there? And so um, one thing that um, we like to talk about is the importance of taking this data and like and using it to coach. Um, and which essentially is like having candid, having candid, crucial conversations with people in order to change the behavior. Like, hey, David Justice, I need you to take more, right? Like, hey, rep, um, you look like you're not multi-threading sufficiently. We need to multi-thread here. Hey, hey, rep, um, I'm observing that we have a conversion rate, a win rate problem out of proposal. We need to figure out that, like, that you're adhering to exit criteria there. Um, and so you can kind of see like what would be some examples of like not coaching versus coaching. So when you're doing data-driven coaching, what you should be doing is you should, unsurprisingly, you should be showing up with data, <laughs> right? Um, and um, and these are some, and, and then also approaching it from the standpoint of like seeking to learn and like observing that there may be an issue here and then co-creating a potential solution there. So, you know, the worst example of this might be like, hey, when's this deal coming in versus, hey, like what's concerning you about this deal? looks like we're only engaged with three contacts there, right? This is a 250 K deal. Typically would, we would expect to be engaged with like eight people or whatever, or, Hey, can you make your forecast bigger versus, Hey, notice that your forecast is pacing behind. Are there any things that we can like potentially pull forward? Right. Are there like, can we, can we strategize on, on things that we can potentially pull forward, maybe using some incentives, uh, et cetera, et cetera, or maybe, maybe we're hosed. Right. And we just need to avoid this, you know, this situation in the future, by doing some more prospecting and pipe gen right now or what have you. And so like, you can kind of see other examples of what that looks like here, but really what it comes down to is, um, you know, showing up with data and then, and then precipitating a coaching conversation there. Max, what, when you've seen like your most successful customers, how do they go about, um, you know, deploying data-driven coaching in their in their day-to-day -day and week-to-week -to, -week to kind of help change behavior with with their reps yeah i think it just being as objective as possible about it right like really using precise language to make it such that like you are you're objectively questioning them about their their business and then like using a tool to kind of give some type of visual aid so they know that you're not just like full of it and like annoying them by asking them about their pipeline. And so right. I think that's like usually like the winning recipe is like being able to show them and then being extremely objective about what you're asking about and like why it's concerning. Yeah, I think that's a great point because we see this especially with some some like more junior managers. And this is actually one of the reasons why we um, we actually have Richard Harris, um, the, the sales enablement um, and sales coach, kind of sales trainer, do managerial trainings monthly for our customers. It's because like being comfortable having those coaching conversations is like a new muscle that a lot of times people have to have to develop. And um, and one of the things that I think can be very helpful there is like having that data that as a manager, it's like, hey, I'm not making this up. <laughs> right like i'm not making this up like i'm not the big i'm not the big bad bear here i'm literally looking at your customer facing meeting volume across the trailing 30 days and like you're substantially lower than the other 10 account executive the other 10 mid-market account executives 
I'm not making this up, right? And then, you know, and then moreover, if we look at that over time, over like the trailing 90 days or the trailing six months or whatever, and like group it on a monthly basis, we can see like, oh, that decline started showing up in, I don't know, July, whatever. What's going on here? What can I do to help, et cetera? That can help a manager kind of have more backbone um, and precipitate that conversation because oftentimes, you know, you know, managers are humans too. <laughs> they don't want to, they, they don't want to view themselves as like the big bad bear and, and what have you. Um, so one kind of framework that I like talking about um, as relates to data-driven kind of coaching and sales management is this concept of the, the, the OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide, and act. It comes from this, uh, this really cool guy, um, this really famous like um, modern air combat strategist, John Boyd, um, who kind of created this concept as relates to dogfighting, right? For, you know, um, kind of air-to-air -air combat. And what it came, came down to is this, this like loop process of observing, like observing in the world, in this case, like looking around, you know, the plane, like looking for the other plane, um, making a judgment about that. So like orienting, be like, okay, he's down here and I'm up here or what have you. And then deciding what the next best action might be there taking that action, right? Okay, I'm going to drop in above him. I'm going to drop, try to drop in behind him or, you know, fill in the blank. Um, and then that's not sufficient, right? Because then what you need to do is loop back again and observe again. And so this behavior, like, did it work? Did it not work? How do they react to me, et cetera? And so this loop right here, this is something that became very popular in the Silicon Valley with respect to startups um, as kind of popularized in Eric Reese's, um the, uh, the lean startup, but this is something that applies in sales management as well, right? Where we're like, we observe what's going on, right? Like, oh, hey, I'm observing that this rep right here has a win rate problem as compared to his peers. Let's go ahead and figure out what might be driving that, right? Or, you know, he's got a win rate problem. He doesn't have an ASP problem. He doesn't have a deal cycle problem. Let's coach that, right? Like, let's figure out what that what the potential issue might be by having a conversation with it, maybe looking at some other metrics as well. Like, um, and then let's take an action, right? Let's, pr let's prescribe a solution. Um, let's say like, okay, Hey, Ryan Howard, we're going to go ahead and get in the batting cage and you're going to work on hitting, you know, hitting the other way. Um, so, you know, you don't keep grounding into, into shifts over here. Like let's prescribe a solution to that. Um, make sure that it's happening, like authenticate that it's happening. And then let's loop back again after an appropriate amount of time and see what came out of it. Did the win rate go up? Did Ryan Howard start hitting it to the left side of the, the infield and stop grounding into uh, stop, stop grounding into double plays, what have you. Um, and so these are some kind of examples of this in, um, in practice that I'm going to kind of spin through here, a couple of stories around um, some data-driven kind of like coaching uh changes here so like this is a rep right here this is actual an, an actual rep who had some um issues driving um you know progressing some of their ops down funnel and so this is a this is an atrium kpi card right here this is actually kind of a little bit of an advanced one this is a conversion rate card so this is the percentage of each ops of ops that are in a given stage that then made it to the next stage there uh, so what you can see is that this rep right here in orange um, had a couple places where he was soft as compared to the the kind of team average there, which is in blue. So he was a little bit softer with respect to getting things out of meeting pending, which is kind of our stage zero. Um, he was a little bit soft with respect to getting things out of security review. He had a big problem getting things out of proposal. You can see that's a very large dip as compared to his peers. Um, and then for whatever reason, you can also see that he had an issue where his conversion rate out of contract was, you know, pretty substantially low as compared to his peers. There were like most, or most peers, you send a contract 95% of the time it's coming back signed. Right. Um, and so like this, these were the areas for improvement. And so there was coaching that kind of went around that. Right. So this is, um, you can kind of see this, this is a different, uh, a different view of the same the same card here, where it's still that conversion rate is right here, but instead of it being all the stages at the bottom, this is just the discovery stage here at top of funnel, 
right? And you can kind of see the trend over time. So what happened here was we worked with the rep on making sure, like doing a better job in discovery, making sure that those, um, like having more impactful conversations that elicited more pain, that demonstrated, um, you know, the, the opportunity for organizations to do, to, you know, change the way that they, they manage their organizations. And what you can see here is this conversion rate went from out of disco went from a kind of like 50 50 flip a coin here to more in the like 80 to 90 range here um in a pretty you know quick amount of time and then the same thing kind of happened with respect to um this is a different kpi here uh, atrium card this is essentially is a card that allows you to measure the number of opportunities that are that make it to a given stage so in this case we call it stage reached in this case the um this is the number of opportunities that we're getting to a POC to like what we call a pilot here. And what you can see is like this rep was, you know, bumping along at like anywhere between like four to six um, uh, ops that were getting to that they were getting to to um, to pilot because of this lower conversion rate right here. And then after that conversion rate went up, lo and behold, just you know, off to the races, right? So like nine, 10, 11 opportunities getting to pilot on a, um, on a monthly basis there. So being more effective with those at bats. Um, and then also the same was trying to true with like late stage behaviors as well. So like their win rate from proposal right here, um, you know, changed pretty substantially from being kind of in the like 50% range to like jumping up pretty substantially there. And so what, what happened as a result is like, this is literally just, uh, over time, what this rep's pipeline looked like, you can kind of see, you know, his pipeline was, this is an MRR, but like his pipeline was like medium there because, you know, stuff would come in, but it also would leak out. And then what you can see here is a lot more stuff is getting mid funnel and down funnel. So the pipeline is just stacking up more and more there. Uh, so that's one example of data-driven um, sales management. Um, another one is kind of like a crucial part of um you know of a rep's existence in an organization is during their their ramp um and so one we actually have a, a master class that that focuses specifically on this but um a really kind of critical time in um in, an, in a rep's um onboarding and ramp is like this period right here before they're going to be closing their first deal and certainly far before but they get to um to, to full productivity and, and it's during this, like after you've done your training, but now are building pipe, this is really the point at which you need to be really monitoring those leading indicators on, on a rep to make sure that they're coming into band. And so we have an example here of an organization that actually used Atrium to kind of catch an issue became, before it became like a very substantial problem. And so um, what you can kind of see here is there's this rep, Chicken Little, that we're going to talk about um, that kind of had this, had this issue. This is a little demo mode here. That's why the, the, the ridiculous name is there. So what's, what's interesting is you can kind of see, this is Atrium's ramp view right here, where you can see uh, it normalizes everybody's start date down here. So this is month one, month two, month three, month four, et cetera. And so what you can kind of see here is that his Chicken Little's opportunity ownership like doesn't look all that terribly bad, especially as compared to peers. Like it's kind of like right in the middle there. So if you were only paying attention to that though, you kind of might, you might be a little head faked. What was crazy though, is that if you looked at his actual activity against those opportunities, so again, you can kind of see these are the opportunities right here. The number of opportunities that are being touched um, is is much lower, right? So the activity, like, so the pipe build is there, sort of like, or like the ops that are in pipe are there, but the activity against them is kind of off. And then moreover, if you look at any sort of prospecting activity, like the unique number of accounts that are being interacted with, you can see that this, you know, Chicken Little is pretty much at the bottom of the pack here. Um, and the same is true with like any other kind of, activity metrics as well. So like account, unique accounts touched, emails sent. Um, and then what happened was you could, this is that stage reached card we were talking about earlier. You can see how many ops were actually getting into disco, right? Uh, like again, so this is how many ops are being owned, but it's insufficient just to like own ops. <laughs> like we got to progress them <laughs> through the pipe and um, and what you can see here is the number of ops that are progressing through Disco, or at least at least to Disco, is pretty substantially off as compared to his peers. And then got like, 
even worse. You know, like, so kind of got up here, not great. What the heck, right? Like something's, something's going on here, especially in light of the fact that his pipe build was like up here, right? So like something's going on here. Something's weird. Um, and then moreover, if you look at like down funnel stuff as well, so like solution presentation, you can see that that's even, you know, that's even lower here as uh, as well, right? So like kind of coming up and then like tailing off and um, and you can kind of see that in with respect to book, like unsurprising that these leading indicators are being problematic. And then of course his bookings are problematic. And so it turned out that, um, you know, over this rep's first quarter in seed ended up with like 40% fewer wins than his peers and about 40 percent fewer bookings going on there and so you know max if you were to if you were to look at a set of metrics like this in ramp you know what what sort of vibe are you picking up with respect to this uh this rep you see a lot of organizations uh sales data yeah i mean like this is like just like a telltale sign of like troubled waters ahead right if like a rep's not doing the activity like early on in their ramp that's a that's a that's a not good sign that we ought to be aware of early on or else we're going to be having a bad time you know in, in three months yeah totally and and you can kind of see that right here right <laughs> like turns out like if you're not if you stop getting things into disco and getting them down funnel in like month month two or month three like guess what month four or month five your your bookings are going to be a problem yeah so what was kind of crazy is that it turned out that this rep actually had a side hustle going um during work hours which is pretty crazy um but actually as i've talked to like more and more customers about this people are like oh yeah you know i've you know we had a something we had a similar situation there um but literally what what happened here is like management had a you know data driven conversation with this rep and was like hey i'm like a, a coaching conversation hey i'm observing i'm observing this thing right here can you can you kind of help me understand like what's going on here because i'm i'm worried about xyz um and it turned out that this this rep was running a side hustle during during work hours um and kind of cop to it and, uh, you know, obviously that was a huge problem. And so the, the organization ended up terminating the rep because like, I mean, just from a, you know, from a, a from a esprit de corps and kind of like a team cohesion standpoint, like you really can't have a rep who's like decided to welch on their team like that, you know, sub so substantially. But the good news was, I mean, unfortunate situation and like, you know, kind of a bummer that like the rep put themselves in the situation and this organization had to contend with this, but like could have been much worse if they had waited to like, month six month seven month eight there because like one not only is it a problem with respect to this this rep individually but also like the rest of the team is kind of sitting there looking at it and being like dude what's going on here right like are we not like do we not believe in management here so um fun little story there and i think there's like there's like you know many other examples of this max when you think about like there are there any sort of uh example like data-driven sales management examples that kind of pop to mind for you for like you know recent uh, opportunities that you've you've worked with that have uh you know that are that like come to mind yeah i think a lot of times when we show the conversion rate from stage and like the win rate from stage card we always learn that there's like a process adherence issue on a team meaning like mm -hmm. they maybe aren't following the exit criteria for moving an op into proposal or into contract out and then we start seeing you know certain reps deviating from the norm i.e maybe getting like happy years down funnel and like moving stuff into a down funnel stage too soon or again not following that like process that was laid out for them from like an exit criteria standpoint i feel like that's like really really common a lot of the calls i'm yeah. on yeah yeah and then and then of course like the negative the negative impact of that of course is the fact that like if you're doing forecasting based on stages if you're doing forecasting based on forecast category or what have you and like reps are pushing things down pipe that are not you know up, not not ready to go down pipe if you mm -hmm. will then that's going to like you know that's going to mess you up uh, from a from a forecasting standpoint it's going to give you a little bit of a head fake there yep makes sense um wonderful well well everybody i think we're we're kind of out of time here hopefully you guys learned some fun stuff around uh data driven data driven management data driven sales management and and kind of it's uh data driven management's impact in um you know, in athletics, if you want to co if you'd like to get a couple copies of five secrets of the sales coach crushing quota, and then also a, um, a coffee is for coaches Yeti, uh, we're going to go ahead and drop the hyperlink here um, for uh, for folks to go ahead and sign up for, for that. Um, and then of course, like you can, yeah, you, 
Um, oh, hi, Eduardo. You're back. Hello. Hey, I'm back. How's it going? That was back. really amazing. I learned a lot. I <laughs> bet the, the audience also did. Uh, we, we, have to, we have to do the, the volleyball version, right? Because I know that you're, yeah. a, big, you're a big volleyball player, right? I, am, I, I used to be. Not anymore. I retired <laughs> when I was 17. <laughs> um, we are going to wrap things up in here but thank you very much Pete and Max for all of this knowledge uh, once again the recording will be available in the Modern Sales Pro um, Modern Sales Pro's previous event website uh, with all the links for the books, the Yeti, the boot camp that we mentioned, and also the slide deck. And if you attended this uh, webinar, you're going to receive a follow-up email with all the links in your inbox, so you don't need to worry too much about it. Uh, also, Hannah is dropping the links right over there in the chat right now, so you can sign up for the mm -hmm. book bundle right now. Um, thank you, Pete. Thank you, Max. That was incredible. And thank you, Atrium, uh, for sponsoring this event um, and providing the great content. Um, while I hang out with the speakers backstage, we will make sure you will receive all the resources that the audience needs to be amazing at uh, data-driven management. Thank you, Pete. Let's go backstage. Thank you, Max.